Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today and the chance to share my experiences in volunteering in Europe over the past several months. Like many people, I was somewhat vaguely aware of the refugee crisis in the Middle East that started to gather such force almost exactly five years ago. I listened to NPR and read the New York Times and isolated stories would occasionally puncture my Western bubble, but I would move on to the next story and the next crisis in fairly short order. But then, like millions of other people, I felt absolutely emotionally devastated when I saw the picture of Alan Kurdi, whose tiny body washed up on the Turkish shore in September 2015. I have chosen not to include that picture in this slide deck because even after viewing it hundreds of times, it still brings me to tears. As many of you know, I have two sons of my own, one slightly older than Alan and one just the same age, three years old. Like so many others, I could see my children in that photo and it changed something in my heart. Later that month, I decided that I wanted to get involved in the crisis in a more tangible way. But before I dive into my personal experiences, please allow me to share a few background slides on the crisis. In 2015, slightly more than 1 million people fled war, violence, and persecution to cross the Mediterranean Sea and seek refuge in Europe. The data in these slides is sourced from the UNHCR and is as of the first week in March. The situation changed dramatically on March 7th, and I will get into that shortly. As shown on the left hand of this slide, the vast majority of refugees come from Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan, although the wars and very real risk of starvation continue to drive people north from Africa. As shown by the graphic on the right half of the slide, most of the refugees seeking shelter in Europe cross the sea from Turkey to the Greek islands and then move through the Balkan countries towards Germany. With as much time as I have spent in Europe, I was somewhat surprised to learn that the country of Greece includes over 200 islands in the eastern Mediterranean, some of which are over 400 kilometers from Athens, but less than 10 kilometers from Turkey. Unfortunately, even with a distance of only a few kilometers, the sea leg of the journey has remained remarkably deadly. Over 4,400 people have drowned in this stretch of water since the start of 2015. This slide shows the number of refugees that have made the journey to Europe via the sea route on a monthly basis since 2015. Even as the weather turned decidedly worse and increasingly dangerous after October 2015, the numbers re remained enormous. The year-over-year -year increases are between five and ten times as great when you examine 2015 versus 2014, as well as when you compare the monthly figures from January and February of this year versus last year. I imagine many people have seen the pictures and videos of the devastation in Syria, and when you do, it becomes much easier to understand exactly why so many people would risk such a painful journey. Let me add just a couple other numbers to this discussion. Since March 2011, 11.5% of Syria's population has been killed or injured. Between 40 and 50% of the entire population of Syria are now classified as displaced people. The number of wounded is put at 1.9 million. And perhaps most shockingly, life expectancy has dropped from 70 in just 2010 to 55 in 2015. These numbers almost defy comprehension. At the end of my presentation, I'm going to return to the topic of the single, often young men who are making this journey, but I did want to highlight the latest demographic figures from the crisis. When politicians seek to capitalize on people's fear, they often describe the potential for quote-unquote radicalized young men to slip in via the flow of refugees. I can tell you that when you are on the ground in the refugee camps and border checkpoints, it is just overwhelming to process how many children you see that have walked hundreds of miles and that have no more tears left in their unfocused eyes. And if you really want to experience how much your heart can strain without bursting, you comprehend that thousands upon thousands of youth are making this journey without parents and without anybody that they can trust. 
So let me briefly recap the agreement between Turkey and the EU that was signed on March 18th, earlier this year. All new irregular migrants crossing from Turkey to, Greek, to the Greek islands will be returned to Turkey. I would highlight here that language is important. The EU has systematically tried to replace the word refugee with the word migrants. Under international law, refugees have certain rights that are not extended to economic migrants, and this is one way the EU is trying to legitimize what many independent observers feel is clearly an illegal arrangement. Starting on April 4th, for every Syrian being returned to Turkey from Greece, another Syrian will be resettled from Turkey to the EU. Turkey committed to prevent new sea or land routes for illegal migration. You might ask how they can do such a thing, and a number of videos have recently emerged of the Turkish Coast Guard swamping or intentionally sinking refugee life rafts. In this agreement, Turkey has extracted quite a lot. Namely, they have gotten visa-free travel across the EU, 6 billion euros in direct payment, and a return of talks to admit Turkey into the EU. I hesitate to speak with too much authority about what has happened on the ground since the Balkan borders were first closed on March 7th, but the reports I hear from volunteers are absolutely horrifying. Macedonia has announced that their borders will remain sealed through, at least through the end of this year. Obviously such an announcement has not stopped desperate people from fleeing violence and starvation. There are now approximately 70,000 people stranded across Greece. New camps are being set up every couple of days at various points across the country, and volunteers are once again scrambling to meet basic needs. Since the week of March 21st, essentially every major NGO has declined to provide service to the new detention centers in Greece. The UNHCR, MSF, the IRC, Save the Children, and the Norwegian Refugee Council all halted their aid programs for refugees on the islands as of last week, saying they wanted no part in a system of illegal detention and deportation. While I applaud such a principled stand, the enormous open question remains, who is there to safeguard the rights of thousands of refugees currently stranded on the Greek islands? So now let me turn to my experiences. I decided in October of 2015 that I wanted to go to Europe and volunteer. Given the resources of the, the wonderful organization I worked for at the time, the Hewlett Foundation, my first stop was to brainstorm ideas internally. However, it was clear I could not make the multi-month commitment that was required to join the efforts of a large NGO. In a very appropriate nod to the power of Silicon Valley and the social networking, Facebook ended up being my best resource on how to get involved. There are thousands of people around the world looking for ways to help. With it. When we spoke with each other, when we found each other, we found hope and purpose. Since my foreign language skills are essentially non non-existent, the people I found online were other English speakers. I ended up corresponding with a group of UK citizens that were leading the volunteer effort in the Calais refugee camp, which is commonly known as the jungle. Calais is a port town in northern France, remarkable only for the fact that it is the place where the channel surfaces on the continent. Today, Calais is a forlorn blight on what should be the world's conscience. Refugees in Calais are almost all seeking to join relatives in the UK. In an inhumane attempt to discourage more refugees from populating the area, the current residents are kept in a state of isolation and fear, as France prohibits MGOs from assisting and instead has the police deploy tear gas on the population on a regular basis. Disease spread with horrific speed this winter and easily preventable illnesses have flourished. I chose this particular image to represent my time in Calais because wherever you go, you are stuck in a sea of mud. And all of that said, the inhabitants of the jungle that I spent time with were unfailingly positive and the long-term volunteers were absolutely incredible. In November of last year, the volunteer team had just moved to a new system that had refugees sharing tools and supplies to finish the shelters in camp, and it worked brilliantly. We moved people out of this mud, and the difference was enormous. A sense of shared journey was the best thing about Calais. 
we made progress together in spite of the French government. In early February of this year, I planned a two-week trip to volunteer at the camps on the border of Greece and Macedonia, and then at the arrival port in Athens. Over the last few years, I imagine everyone has read multiple stories on Greeks' economic woes. The country has balanced on the edge of bankruptcy and debt default, and its citizens have endured the sharpest edge of austerity. And with that, its citizens have been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for their response to the refugee crisis. Seemingly as always, those with the least give the most. Wonderful people who are giving every free moment to help. Families that are donating resources they don't have to spare. People who are working together to find solutions. Over the past few months, many people have asked me the perfectly rational question of why I decided to go to Europe and volunteer. After all, many friends were making a huge difference by donating to trusted groups, and my family started out doing the same. But I just couldn't quiet my mind that way, an entirely personal struggle that seems to have only grown stronger over time. I learned much in clay, but I wanted to go back to Europe, and I still didn't have an answer as to exactly why. I found that answer in Macedonia. My favorite job at the Macedonian border was to distribute the food right as people first walk into the camp. Independent volunteers have had issues with the international NGOs in different locations along the refugee route, and stating the obvious, the staff of those NGOs are there to work. They were there a long time before I got there, and they were going to stay a long time after I left. Like everyone, they got tired, and it can show. But when I had the chance to greet each person that walked in, I had the opportunity to break through the fog of such a hard journey. Of course, it didn't work every time, but I would say that the vast majority of time that I made eye contact, that I truly smiled, that I welcomed people with warmth, that I knelt down to meet children at their height and handed them food, a brief moment of magic happened. Frowns melted, crying stopped, connections were made. A person's dignity is at the core of their existence. Connecting with and helping restore a piece of that dignity is why I wanted to go, why I wanted to go back, and why I'm going to go back in the future. While volunteering, there were also moments of pure joy, and I wanted to share at least one of those today. Almost all of my friends know that I have a true addiction to sugar. I try my best in the real world to limit my consumption and to prevent my kids from developing the same problems I have. But in a refugee camp, a small treat can bring just an amazing flash of happiness to a child. I packed 15 pounds of Willy Wonka candy, candy to take with me to Greece, and I probably bought another 30 pounds of caramels while there. Without question, handing out sweets was the highlight of my day. Once people arrived in the camp, they, got, they went into a reception tent to eat while waiting for their papers to be processed for the next leg of their journey. I would wait for them to finish their food that we handed out and then walk up and down the aisles to hand out the candy. Kids who were crying stopped for at least a couple minutes and others just beamed their amazing smiles. It was the best part of the day. I also want to give a, a quick nod to the Hewlett Foundation for the fantastic contribution to the refugees who were stuck at the Gevgilia camp for extended periods of time. The IT department at Hewlett generously donated two laptops with DVD players and two projectors that I set up in the reception tents at the camp. This young guy had a great time watching me get everything set up and running, and when Frozen started playing, he was absolutely transfixed. Many things that seem so small to us can just make an enormous difference in a chaotic situation. On a practical level, the refugees had an enormous number of needs outside of food and entertainment while in the midst of a 2,000 mile journey. One of the things that had truly horrified me in clay was how few people had anything on their feet that even resembled functional shoes. I was in clay in November when the weather turned quite cold and the freezing rain had made that mud a permanent fixture, but many people were still wearing sandals or worn out keds with gaping holes in them. One of the many wonderful things that we were able to do in Macedonia was to provide new shoes to refugees in need. In the course of a week, 
we were able to distribute several thousand pairs of shoes, and each and every time you could see the immediate relief that this provided. Of course, with 100, with 100,000 people moving through the Balkan route per month last year, we were never going to be able to meet all of the needs of the people we met. But we were able to make an absolutely enormous difference with very little. And then we could stand back up and do it again. I wrapped up my February trip by traveling to Athens and volunteering down at the port where refugees arrived via ferry from the Greek islands. I had planned to purchase food for people to take with them on the 12 hour bus ride from, from Athens to the northern border at Endemini. And on my first trip at the port, I met a group of American volunteers from Carry the Future. This organization was founded last year by a woman in Southern California and started as a single modest Indiegogo campaign to raise $2,500 and, and 100 baby carriers. As a result of this campaign going viral, Carry the Future now has a network of over 3,000 volunteers from around the world, 50,000 followers on Facebook, and they've delivered over 6,000 baby carriers as of the spring. Given how much time I spent in the early part of this decade wearing my own kids, I was happy to jump in, and now I am a particularly enthusiastic supporter of this group. Finally, I want to come back to the topic of the young single men that are migrating to Europe. A recurring narrative in the political debates in both the US and Europe is that we must fear immigrants. Even if you exclude the voices of the worst xenophobes, many other people are urging us to be fearful of radical young men infiltrating with the refugees. The use of fear for personal gain is a long-standing tool, but that doesn't mean it is any less heartbreaking or infuriating when it happens. These three men in this picture are from Syria. Once they reached fighting age, they had exactly three choices in life. Fight, flight, or die. It is the very act of turning away young men like these that will ensure the conditions that allow radicalization to take hold. By fleeing Syria, these men chose a life of peace. I was absolutely filled with happiness to be able to help them and I am entirely convinced that they are going to make the world a better place. And that's the message I want to use to end this presentation. We are currently living in a time that has produced more displaced people than any other era in recorded human history. The UNHCR stated that as of mid-2015, more than 60 million people worldwide had been forced to flee their homes under the threat of violence. In the West in general, but certainly in California in particular, it is easy to feel completely removed from these type of realities. But if you are willing to listen to the stories, you will find millions of people seeking peace. I certainly don't have any macro solutions to offer, but I do know we can make a huge difference to the people that we choose to see and whose suffering we choose to acknowledge. I thank you for the chance to share my story and hope that you can help me increase the awareness of this global problem. Thank you.